as I will mention several times during this course, it's very, very important when you're studying history to know the background of the person who's providing you the information, whether you're reading an article, a book, or indeed listening to a history professor myself. For that reason, I want to spend two or three minutes just to give you a little of my background to see where I'm coming from. Why, you may ask? Well, the study of history involves a selection process, what we should study and how we should view it. And we'll talk a little more about that in the rest of this introduction and throughout the course. My resume is posted in the Learning Web, and there is a link to it that you should have already seen in the introductory section of this module. What I'd like to do is just talk for just a moment about what I did for the last 34 years before I started teaching. I was a professional career diplomat with the Department of State in Washington, D.C. as a career foreign service officer, where I had the honor to spend 25 years living overseas in various embassies. And the rest of the time I worked in Washington, D.C., representing the United States of America. So please advance to the next slide. Now, if I were to ask you in person what a diplomat does, I'd get a wide range of answers. Essentially, it's to represent the interests of the United States around the world, not only with other governments, which is a traditional role, but also with foreign publics. So there's a lot of what's public relations or what's called public diplomacy involved. And often you people think of it as just an elegant job. And you can see on the next slide the meeting rooms in Washington, D.C., where we had many of our meetings at the State Department. This is a view of the Garden of the American Ambassador's House in Paris, France. By the way, this beautiful mansion in downtown Paris was donated to the United States government by a wealthy American. And what we have here is a large July 4th reception, which is being held at the ambassador's house, which is done at all US embassies around the world. And this photo was taken before most of the three to 4,000 guests arrived. On the next slide, you will, you will see um, US Marines at, in Moscow, Russia, and we have Marines posted at most US embassies. This is a photo of me on the left when I served as acting ambassador in Ecuador. And on my, my right is the new U.S. ambassador arriving. And in her left hand, she's holding some papers. And those are the papers signed by the President of the United States, designating her as the United States representative in Ecuador. And she will, in a few minutes after this was taken, hand those documents to the president of, of the country. You will notice the red carpet and the very elegant guards. On the next slide, I have a photo of me speaking um, at a large uh, July 4th party at an embassy overseas. And finally, on the, the following two slides, uh, you have some photos of me with President Bill Clinton for two years while I was working for the State Department, I was assisting President Clinton with his global travels. And on, on the left, you see when I'm shaking hands with him outside his hotel suite, I have on the lapel of my suit, the button that the Secret Service gives us to get access to the floor the president is staying on in a hotel. And the next slide is, is simply the president being welcomed to sign the guest book in a hotel. Well, the slides you've just seen may well reinforce your view that diplomatic life is pretty nice. It's all glamour. Probably asking yourselves where you sign up. Well, unfortunately, in the modern world, over the last 40 or 50 years, the life of a diplomat is also very, very dangerous. You'll see the, the next few slides, some photos <coughs> of various places where I have worked. 
uh, we have a, a large mob trying to break into the embassy in Yemen. Um, and this is only protected by six U.S. Marines. The following slide was taken outside the embassy in Rome, Italy. And there you see a much more peaceful group of demonstrators, uh, which is what you see virtually every day in American embassies. The next slide <coughs> is in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, where we have a, a group expressing their displeasure with the United States. Then the next slide where we have a standoff between riot police on the left and a group of several thousand demonstrators on the right is in Mexico City. Those of you who know Mexico City will know that that is the Paseo de la Reforma and that's the angel of uh, Mexican independence behind that. These large demonstrations like this in Mexico City took place three or four times a week um, during the six years I spent there and usually resulted in a few people among the demonstrators throwing bombs or trying to shoot shotguns into the embassy. And then finally, the next slide, a group of my bodyguards. <coughs> um, this was when I was serving in Mexico five years ago. And this photograph is taken less than a mile from the U.S. border in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, which is just across the river as you know, from Laredo, Texas. And this is the group of bodyguards I had behind my armored car, and I had another group in front of the armored car. You've now seen the cover of an advertisement for the movie Argo, which several years ago won the Academy Award for the best movie of the year. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you see it. It's about 98% accurate. This was my first assignment in the State Department. We'll talk a little about this incident later in the in history 1302. This occurred in the fall of 1979 when a group of protesters sponsored by the Iranian government took over the U.S. Embassy in Iran. On the right, the next slide, we have what we often see at American embassies, someone burning a flag in front. This was my first job. I was in Washington in the task force. Um, that's me in the back with the longer hair we wore at the time. Um, we're actually talking with the group that took over the embassy. <clears throat> Just one point I'd like to make with this slide is we often hear about the economic decline of the United States. And while the United States certainly does have some serious economic issues, it's important to put it in context. This is a map of the world where the size of each country on this map reflects the size of that country's economy. So you can see the United States there, which on this map is much larger than it is in terms of actual geography. And that's because the United States represents over a quarter of the global economy. And if you look down South America, it's much smaller on this map than it would be on a global map. Looking at the right of this slide, you see the big blob up in the upper right-hand corner, and that is Japan, which, as you all know, is a, a relatively small country in terms of geography, but it's a very large economy. If you look in the, the middle of the map, uh, about halfway down, you see sub-Saharan Africa, which is a huge area geographically and a very, very large population, and just gives you an idea of how poor Africa is. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we must all keep in mind that when we're studying history, what we're doing is interpreting what happened in the past. We're not going to simply learn a lot of dates and events. It's important we know the dates the essential dates, the essential events, and their chronology. We do not need to know dates in terms of the month, day of the month, and the year. Often, if you know the date within a few years, that's absolutely fine, because what we're trying to look at here is the interpretation. And I don't know, many of you, when I took U.S. history in high school, my teachers simply emphasized that we memorize long lists of dates, names, and places. 
And in terms of dates, I'm talking about the month, the day of the month, and the year, which I frankly don't think is particularly necessary. Now the next slide, talk about how do we interpret things. You and I, each one of us has a different viewpoint. Now this point of view can be called our bias. The word bias has a very negative connotation, but we all must recognize that we have our own points of view and our bias, and this is determined by our own particular background, our, our reading, our studying, and our various experiences. And so we're often going to find in the studying of history that there are a number of interpretations for an event. Um, please go to the next slide when we talk briefly about Benedict Arnold. <coughs> now, if I were going to ask you who is Benedict Arnold, certainly those of you who studied history earlier in the United States would think of a traitor. You might forget the particulars. And just to remind you, Benedict Arnold was one of George Washington's most senior generals. He was a hero in the early part of the, the American colonists' struggle against the British for independence. But during the course of the war, he changed sides, and he gave the plans to an important army base to a British spy. Benedict Arnold found out that they were on his trail, and so he escaped, fought for the British during the rest of the American Revolution, and then went and, and moved in London, where he died uh, some years later. On the next slide, you'll see <coughs> sort of a, a poster from the time Benedict Arnold was wanted for treason. The reward of $200 in today's uh, with today's prices is a significant amount of money. Benedict Arnold, most people born and raised in the United States would immediately say he was a traitor. In fact, I went to Amazon and I just did a search for books on Benedict Arnold and this is the very first one that came up. Traitor, the case of Benedict Arnold. Now that's the view largely in the United States. What about in Great Britain? Well, Britain, of course, was trying to fight to hold on to its colony. So in London, about three blocks from where I lived when I worked at the American Embassy there, we have this house you can see, and there's a plaque on the right side of the door. If you advance to the next slide, you see that Benedict Arnold lived there from 1796 until he died in 1801 but he is referred to here as an American patriot. He was a patriot in, British, in the British eyes for the American colonies, the British colonies in the Americas. So, and here, uh, I was in London a couple years ago and I took this photo just showing my surprise to, to see this slide. But the question is, who is right? Who is right? Well, I think you'd all agree it depends on our interpretation. Another example of different interpretations of the same event occurred during the U.S.-Mexico War of 1846 to 1848, where, see in the next slide, in Mexico City at Chapultepec Castle, which still exists, you can go visit it today, this was the Military Training Academy for the uh, Mexican military officers, and there were young officers there, people in training, you know, 16, 17 years of age. During the war in 1847, U.S. forces were near the bottom of the hill and about to overtake it, but rather than surrendering to the Americans, six of the Mexican military students chose to commit suicide by jumping to their death down the, the cliff. Now, in the United States, this is not well known, this particular incident at Chapultepec Castle. In fact, it's very, very difficult to even find mention of this in any book written by an American historian. However, in the next slide, you'll see the date that these six cadets 
committed suicide is now a national holiday in Mexico to celebrate these six uh, teenagers. It's known as El Dia de los Niños Héroes, and it's a major holiday. And in every Mexican city and village that I've been in, there's a street named after the child heroes. In Mexico City, you visit it today at the castle. You have these six marble uh, monuments commemorating the six cadets. And the Mexican president meets all foreign leaders there. Move on now to China. What is happening today in China? Well, as you know, China has an authoritarian government, and the government has been rewriting the history textbooks, understanding the importance of history. And this is from the cover of the British uh, weekly magazine, The Economist. But if you look at President Xi of China, he has a rifle in his hand, but at the end of that rifle, you can see a pen. And the article inside is entitled Xi's History Lessons, because what he is doing in China, and the Chinese have been doing for several years now, is rewriting their history books to portray the Japanese as, as more evil against China. And this has to do, because, as you may, may have heard of, because of the current dispute between China and Japan over some islands in the South China Sea. So as I mentioned, our interpretations of history, whether it's my interpretation, the authors of the textbook, the authors of the articles we're going to read, or your interpretations, they all just depend on our own particular background and our point of view or bias. This is not necessarily bad, but we have to recognize this up front in the course. And it's like the old joke that two people disagree about religions. One person could well t tell the other, huh, it's my religion, your superstition, not even recognizing the validity of another person's religious beliefs. So again, I will emphasize it's absolutely essential to know the background of the speaker or author. And when we start reading short articles during this course, one of the first questions you should ask yourself is, who wrote this? An obvious case is, if we're studying slavery in the 1800s in the southern part of the United States, and you read an article that's written by a slaveholder, it's obvious that that person is going to have completely different views on slavery than if it were written by a northern abolitionist who supports the abolition of slavery. The next slide, I have a brief excerpt from a high school history textbook that was used throughout the United States, not just in the South, in the 1930s. And you could see the portrayal of black slaves in the 1930s. This is what your grandparents may have read, or great-grandparents. This is not the same as you would read today. It says the Negro plantation days was usually happy. He was fond of the company of others. He was loyal to a kind master or overseer. And we don't have to look just at history books to see how changing interpretations are affecting uh, the United States today. Several years ago, Houston Independent School District renamed four high schools, which have been named after military or civilian leaders of the Confederacy during the Civil War. And of course, in 2016 and 2017 in particular, there were demonstrations throughout the United States to remove statues from the public spaces which had been celebrating uh, military or, or civilian leaders like Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy. Just a few final thoughts here before we jump into the first chapter in this course. When we're studying history here, our goal is to understand what happened, what the actors on all sides felt. We, that doesn't mean we, we approve of what they did, but we need to understand what they did. We're not here to judge them. 
We also want to look forward, not backward. Let me give you an example of this, and I have this on the slide. The U.S. Civil War. Well, everybody knows the North won, the South lost. But the participants at the time didn't know that. In fact, both the North and the South, at the very beginning of hostilities, felt that they would win what they wanted very, very quickly in just a matter of weeks and get the other side to give them what they wanted. The same thing when we're studying World War II, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and we'll go into this in detail in History 1302, the Japanese thought a knockout blow to the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii would lead to a negotiated settlement to the United, with the United States. That certainly was, was not the outcome. So again, as hard as it is, we have to go back and pretend we're in a, a time machine and try and understand the situation at the time and pretend you don't know the outcome. Finally, when we have discussions, and in this course we, we have discussions, sort of informal discussions in, in writing, please remember to discuss on a professional level. I encourage people to express disagreement. You can disagree with what I said, what the textbook said, what other students say, but please, please do it on a professional level, as you would with in your uh, upcoming professional careers. And in fact, one of the readings uh, that I, I gave you in the introductory section of this module discuss some good strategies to disagree with people, you know, acknowledge what they've said, and then disagree. Or I also put devil's advocate. Often it's useful in a conversation, whether oral or in writing, to take the pos position you may not agree with or the other person agree with just to encourage the discussion. And one final thought on the last slide is, throughout this course and in the future, try and remember that the study of history, your, your own personal interpretation of history does very much impact your own view of the world today and in the future. And others may, may well have different interpretations. Okay, well, well, we'll see you again in the next chapter.